Now it's time to invite Mr. Nicholas Sturman, Identification Manager for DIA Bangkok, to talk to us about per laboratory notes. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I hope that uh, what I described today will be of interest to you. Um, we've been hearing about the challenges of pearl testing. I'll give a little bit more information with some examples later on about that. But the pearl laboratory notes that I'm going to talk about now are some topics about labs themselves, because although many people here are from labs, there are some who maybe have no idea about labs, so it's good to give some perspective about the work that we do. Um, so I'll move forward on that. Okay, so gemological pearl testing laboratories, past and present. This is what I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, the day-to-day -day analytical work on client submissions. Research and production of articles for the trade and public. Field research trips. Education. Promotion, networking via presentations at conferences and other external events. And then unusual submissions and identification challenges with a summary at the end. So all of these things are what labs and the institutes that labs belong to, if they're not independent labs, have to do on a, pretty much on a daily basis. Um, labs. Okay, so this uh, is basically just showing you some of the labs in the world that exist that do or offer pearl testing as services. There are many labs that exist in the world. Not all of them carry out pearl testing because pearl testing is pretty specialized business. So you've got to have people who understand pearl testing itself. Um, there are ones from all over the world here. Some of you will probably recognize all of them and others probably haven't heard of some of them. So I'll just quickly go through. Uh, yeah, okay. Over here, we have an English one. This is Italian, says Jem. Of course, you know Danart. This is a German lab. We have Dubai. This is Elizabeth, who unfortunately was supposed to be here today, but unfortunately she, she's, I think, not well. She couldn't make it. Uh, I think you know who that is. This is in England. This is um, the combined in Liechtenstein. Um, Gublin is obviously Switzerland. This is uh, Italian. The French lab. Um, Hanko from Netherlands is here. This is probably the only lab that specializes only pearl testing, as far as I know. All the other labs do the work which I showed you on the first slide. Um, then we have SSEF, of course. And then GIT, Thailand. And then this is another English lab, um, which uh, I used to work with a gentleman who operates that now. Okay, flashback. 2010, Bahrain. There are a few people in the audience here who are shown here. Um, of course, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, you'll know that Ali Safar is here, and we've got uh, Ken here, we've got myself here, someone hiding at the back here. Tom, he's here. Um, so there, there are a beer, of course, you know here. So quite a few members. And Michael was supposed to be here, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. And we have Jean-Pierre here now on his behalf. So this, this was, uh, I said, 2010 photo. It was the last time I was in Bahrain. And this was when I worked in Bahrain, a bit younger. Um, and I'm just showing you really what Abir was just talking about. I mean, these, these are not really seed pearls. I mean, some of them are probably seed pearls, but we were using the bags, putting the film inside, x-raying them ourselves, developing the film in the dark room, and then looking at the structure. So now it's moved on a bit. And if anyone is really interested, you can all look at later. Anyone who's interested can actually see the film that we used to use. Um, I don't know, probably in the lab. 
Most labs, they, they do not use film anymore, so it's moved on. Um, just a little bit about the labs. Existence since 1925. This was when the first lab was actually started operation. And this is a photo of Basil Anderson, Basil W. Anderson, 1901 to 1984. He was the first gemologist, really, that started the pearl business off in the lab in London. And um, since after that, the equipment basically was very limited when he started. We had things like the endoscope. I'll explain that later, because otherwise it would take too long. And after the endoscope, it was only certain parts that could be tested because there weren't x-rays. The x-rays were introduced later, um, as you can see here, 1929 or so it came into existence in the lab. So they were only separating obvious bead cultured from naturals with the endoscope. Then we had uh, freshwater non-bead cultured pearls came in the markets in the 1950s. That made things a little bit more complicated. Saltwater non-bead cultured pearls started emerging in the market in the 1970s, and then atypical bead cultured pearls started appearing in the 2000s. So these are sort of the different developments that came in the market, and all the labs had to deal with these different steps as they appeared. In the old days, this was probably the first type of uh, x-ray tube that would be used, and it was very unsafe compared to what we have these days. In the lab now, we have these which are all sort of lead-lined. They have interlocks on them, so if the x-rays are operated and the door is open, they cut off automatically. But in the old days, when, when they started to do the x-raying, this basically was the sort of method that you have with a dentist. If you go in, you know nowadays, even today, you go in, they let you sit down, and then they run out the room and expose you to x-rays, and then go back in. The same sort of procedure happened before. They, they was a little bit unsafe to use these, um, and it was mainly for diffraction work. And what is diffraction? Okay. What is diffraction work? Well, again, I've got later, if anyone wants to see this, I've got this. This is a six spot, and this is a four spot. And it produced this diffraction x-ray pattern from that tube, depending on the crystallography in the pearl. So with a natural pearl structure, it was radial. And if the x-rays went through the C-axis of the crystals, the aragonite crystals, you'd get the six-spot pattern. If they went through the side of the aragonite crystals, so no, no pseudo-hexagonal pattern, you would get a four-spot pattern. So this would prove that it's a bead-cultured pearl. If you got two of these, you knew it was a natural pearl, but you would have to pass through the center of the pearl. Uh, again, I can explain this in more detail later because I don't have much time. So what about the day-to-day -day operation in a lab? Well, you can, you can see, if you have sort of not much of an idea about lab work, that x-rays are the main way that labs test pearls. Um, you have the x-ray best based techniques are the backbone of any gemological lab. So we have microradiography, X-ray computed microtomography, X-ray luminescence, and energy dispersive X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, or sometimes we'd say just EDXRF for short. There are other techniques which we can use, which are ultraviolet visible near-infrared spectrophotometry, um, Raman and photoluminescence spectrometry and laser ablation induction decoupled plasma mass spectrometry, LAICPMS. These are all used for, for checking the sort of chemistry of pearls or the color and the color um, to see whether pearls are naturally colored or not and the actual composition of pearls. So they all have very independent or individual uses. Um, this is the CT. Uh, pearl being set up in the foam on the, on, in the CT machine. That's the x-ray tube. So, research and resulting articles. It's very important, of course, that any lab carries out research and then produces articles afterwards. Not only does it develop the staff who are doing the work, but it also informs the public and the trade. So, these are just a couple of them that I've done. GIA has the Gems and Gemology magazine, and uh, this one is Provenance Determination of Freshwater Pearls by ICPMS, 
and, and the linear discriminant analysis method. Um, this was a project which the staff did from their own just to see whether we can separate the non-bead cultured freshwater pearls from natural freshwater pearls that have overlapping complex structure. So it's not always easy to separate the pearls as you know. We also do, like other labs, the um, uh, radiocarbon dating. So Danat do radiocarbon dating, SSEF do, uh, Gubelin, this is a joint article with Gubelin. Um, so there are many labs that do this work. It's not just a select few, and GIA also do it. We also go, as I said, to field trips. Field trips are very important. You have to go to the field to get the samples. You can only do research on samples, but you know essentially where they came from. We don't really, we can't really trust people and say, okay, where did this come from? And they say, oh, it came from here. How do we know? We weren't there. So you really need to go to the field, whether it's gemstones from a mine or pearls from wherever. So this was uh, an image when we went to Tennessee, the US team who sort of I work with, um, they went and unfortunately, uh, Gina, she's not here, otherwise I hope she would have been surprised by this photo. She was here yesterday, but she's no longer here. She left this morning or last night. And her daughter, Sabrina, we went to visit Tennessee Lake and we actually took some of the mollusks. Uh, we have the Free Ridge and we have been carrying out DNA work on this in America, actually in Canada. So most labs will have to do um, partnership with some other institute for some of these projects. So we're working with a, a university in Canada. And not only do we publish things uh, in the uh, Gems and Gemology magazine, we also put things on our website. So again, labs will share information on their websites or institutes will. And this was after that trip, we put uh, some videos and other images on our website and we wrote an article. So anyone who's interested in learning more, you can go to the website and you can see. Um, again, on the field trip side, the DNA work. Um, so we do carbon dating and again, we also do DNA work because as I said on the last slide, the Tennessee work, we're trying to do DNA on fresh water. We also do DNA on this, uh, we had the, the team in Tokyo, they went to Umojima and they took samples of a koya from the farm there and we did DNA work on those to prove that they were Pinktada Fukata and uh, it proved definitely that they were definitely Pinktada Fukata. Um, so it's very valuable and we, that means we can do the DNA work not only in uh, Canada, we can do it in Japan as well. So we, we have different options to do the DNA work. Um, I said education. Education is very important to any lab, any institute. Um, I know that uh, Danat have just been doing a Pearl course. So they have their own internal Pearl course. I know SSEF have their Pearl course. And of course, uh, GIA, we have our Pearl course. So this was a group of per people who were in Carlsbad. They did our Pearl course on 7th of this month. And this is the photo of them getting their certificate at the end of the course. But not only do we have external education, we have internal education. You have to teach your staff. So here I am just explaining some ICP work which was done um, from the article that was done in CB with the team. We have to sort of teach each other. We have to discuss things. So all labs have to do that with their staff. The staff have to learn internally. Um, promotion and networking, again, something we all have to do. Conferences and seminars like this here in Bahrain are very important. We share information, we learn from other people. We also have to go to exhibitions in various parts of the world. Um, we have show labs. Many of the labs have show labs. They do testing on site in the shows. 
Um, this is Las Vegas for GIA. And we do tailored events for trying to promote um, the Institute, our services, etc. And for GIA, we have uh, the career fair. So our students will be able to actually meet people from the trade and see about potential jobs. Um, so it's very important to, to try and, and tailor events. Right, so that's a little bit about the labs and what they do, and obviously because I'm from GIA, I focused on GIA. Um, but now I'm going to talk about some submissions, so things which we've received which maybe will interest you. Um, so the majority, again, as Ken was mentioning before, uh, and Abir was just mentioning, it's not always the case that everybody agrees on everything. So in labs, the majority of submissions two laboratories received are straightforward and all the gemologists will agree on the result. Gemologists from other labs would also agree. However, from time to time, all laboratories receive interesting, intriguing, challenging, you can use whatever word you like, pearls for identification. And seed pearls are another matter completely. I couldn't spend a whole day talking about seed pearls. The results of the latter may lead to some differences of opinion between gemologists in the same lab, let alone other labs. Okay, so we have three pearls here. They're all large. Maybe Rui, when he's talking later, he'll be talking about some antique large pearls. And one, one thing you know about large antique pearls is that quite often there's one thing about them when you x-ray them, and that is that they tend to be hollow or partially hollow. So that's sort of my theme on these three pearls. And when you x-ray, then the, the, the interesting things appear, because you just don't know until you x-ray them. So what we have here is one pearl weighing 34 carats. So you see the me measurements here, because this one is the weight of the metal included, so we don't know the weight of it. But the measurements are sort of similar. They're all, all similar measurements. Um, and then this one, 44 carats. So what do we see inside? Well, that's the first one. When we x-ray and we see inside, this was actually submitted twice to GIA. The first time it was mounted in a, a pendant. And you can see there's a lot of metal. So the, the opaque areas here are the, where the x-rays cannot pass through the metal. And all around is the pearl itself. Here you have, well, actually, this whole area, the darker area, is basically a, a void, a cavity in the pearl. But there's this area here which is slightly different. It's not really pearl structure. And it's got this peg running through it. So this really is a filling of some material just, just to lend support for that metal peg for something to bite into. Otherwise, it would just be in the cavity and may move around. So the client, when he knew that it was partially hollow and filled, he didn't like that result. He said, okay, I'll remove all the metal. And he did. So this is when we saw it the second time. You can see there's no metal anywhere. He removed all the mounting and he removed the filling. He, so basically he got another report later saying that it was not filled. He didn't like filled. So it's a natural, partially hollow pearl. And Ultra, interestingly enough, he wanted us to do carbon dating on this. So we did carbon dating work on it. And we found that it was um, hundreds of years old. And that, of course, it had to be a natural pearl because it was before any culturing. This is the other one, the middle one. It was a a uh, cultured pearl, so this is the bead. This was all hollow, and this part here, the metal, is hiding a very large opening on the surface of the pearl. And when that was open, they filled it with a coir cultured pearl beads to fill up the gap, and then they plugged it again with the metal. So, and this is another direction. So it was very interesting. You know, you just don't know what you're going to find until you x-ray. So it's exciting for gemologists when you x-ray a pearl, a big one. What are you going to find? Okay, well, something's gone funny here. 
Um, this is the other one. So you can see that basically it's got, a, again, a void in it. And it's got this structure here, which maybe someone could think was something which had been inserted inside the pearl. But in actual fact, this is a large, non-bead cultured pearl. Um, I don't know where the other picture disappeared to, but it just showed it in another direction. And it showed that it was not something which had been put inside the pearl. Um, now, you would think that maybe it's the only problems you sometimes get with pearl testing are between um, natural pearls and non-bead cultured pearls and trying to separate them. But in actual fact, this is a pearl which was interesting because it weighed around 16 carats. You can see it's a very nice drop shape. It was submitted to one lab in 2009 as undrilled natural pearl was received as a result. The second lab, 2010, again, undrilled, a natural pearl result was given. Lab three, 2012, it was partially drilled. So someone had decided to drill it, but we had uh, records of it when it was later uh, discussed with us. And it was given as non-bead cultured pearl. So it went from natural pearl to non-bead cultured pearl. But lab four, of course, was GIA, 2012, partially drilled, we found it as a bead cultured pearl. So the same pearl had received natural, non-bead cultured, and bead. So bead cultured pearls can be difficult if you know, sufficient care is not taken during the testing procedure. So you've got to be careful about any pearls you're testing. And it may not be obvious, but this is the inner bead demarcation. So it is um, a bead cultured pearl, and I, I can see why it would have some, been something which would have caused trouble in some labs. And lastly, um, before I get to the summary, because I know I've probably gone over the time, this was a pearl which was submitted in Hong Kong, GIA Hong Kong recently. So it looks like a pretty straightforward pink tarda margaritifera, or Tahitian if you want to say, cultured pearl in a ring. It was quite a large pearl. But when we x-rayed it, whoops. When we x-rayed it, this is what we found. It was a bit strange. My 30 years, I've never seen this before. 30 years of pearl testing. So I'd be very interested if anyone else who has experience in pearl testing has ever seen something like this. Um, but essentially, it had this metal thing in the drill hole. The drill hole almost went right up to the surface. And you can see here, it's got sort of like wire twisting around it here and this point. So when we increased the magnification, we could see that it's like a, an element in a bulb with a twisted wire around it. And you can see it's a perfect demarcation. So it's essentially, it's like a bead, but it's not a bead. And you can see the edge of the drill hole. So this material here, the radio translucency of it suggests that there's a material in there and it's not just a void. So it could be resin, could be wax, it could be some other material. And it had like two contact points as well. This is the metal of the ring, the post of the ring. So it sort of seems like it's some electronic device in, in the pearl. And the client was not amused when we told him. And we said to him, please, take it out and sell it to us. We'll buy it. We want to cut it in half and see what it is. And he, he didn't want to do that. So we still don't really know what it is. So anyone with experience, uh, Tom, Ken, let me know. <laughs> yeah. And we did think that maybe it was RFID technology. Um, there is a company in Hong Kong that does it. And, uh, Many labs have written articles before about this sort of thing. So we, we went to the company in Hong Kong because it's a Hong Kong submission. So the team just contacted the, the factory in Hong Kong and said, you know, we want to buy some of your samples and just check to see if it's the same thing. And we bought this one um, just as an example to see. And if you use the right uh, software on your phone, you can actually get the data to come out on, on your phone on the screen because it has the chip inside it, and it will tell you that it's uh, French Polynesia, it's round, the color, other information which has been input for that chip. 
Um, so we x-rayed it, and that's what we found. So you know, this is a typical shell bead nucleus. Um, and the opacity, radio opacity of it is typical. So it's definitely not the same as we just saw in that ring. We've got our RFID chip in here, and we magnify it. You can see very clearly it's completely different. And this is another direction where you can see the boundary where they cut the bead in half, and they made a little pocket for the chip to go in, and then they have put it together again. And we've put it recently, sort of a few days ago, we wrote an article and put it on the website. So if you want to read it in more detail, you can go to the GIA website and read about it. So, summary. The majority of labs and most staff in each lab will agree on the results of most pearls. Knowledge is power, but enthusiasm pulls the switch. You can do a job and you know how to, to do it, but if you're enthusiastic about that job, it makes it even more interesting. Research and field trips are very important. Without having the proper samples to do the research, you can't really progress. Even the experts don't always agree or get it right. And that's in any part of any profession. You can even say a doctor. We've heard many stories about doctor making misdiagnosis, and that's even worse in some respects. It can be life-threatening. So, you know, yes, we all like to get it right, but we're human. Challenges still remain, even after decades of pearl testing experience between the labs. New technologies, techniques will no doubt come into play. So Jean-Pierre will be talking a little bit more about the DNA and the carbon dating and some other things later, so you'll see how that fits in. So thank you very much. I hope something was of interest in there for you.